Hare Krishna. So I'll speak today on the topic of how when life hurts us, don't let the mind hurt us more. I'll speak about how when we are put in a difficult situation, when we are put in a sorry situation, the, the mind makes us feel sorry for ourselves. And that worsens the situation. So I'll speak this based on the pastime, the sixth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the pastime of Ritrasur. This is 6, 12, 15. Ritrasur is speaking to Indra. Pashyamam nirjitam shatru rukna rutam pujam rude ghatamanam yatha shakti tava prana jihir shayam. So, the Vritrasur's pastime is told over four chapters, broadly speaking. It starts from the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th chapter of the 6th canto. And this chapter is called as Vritrasur's glorious death. <coughs> How many of you have heard the story of Vritrasur before? Okay, almost most of you. Okay. So, in summary, Vritrasur was in the previous life a great king named Chitraketu, and somehow he was cursed to become a demon. And as a demon, he acted in a demoniac way and he attacked Indra. So, <clears throat> although he became a demon, he appeared as a demon through the yajna that a Brahmin performed in order to take revenge of Indra. So, Twashta had a son Vishwarupa who had been killed by Indra and Twashta wanted someone who would kill Indra. But Tashta chanted some mantras wrong and that's why he got a son who would be killed by Indra instead of who would, who would kill Indra. So, it was nowadays for many people one of the worst nightmares for them <coughs> is say if they get a diagnosis you have got cancer. Cancer is almost, in many cases, incurable. I was just in America for three months and in the devotee community itself, I met around eight devotees, all young, who have got cancer. And they're all in different stages. Some are fighting and have got cured of it. Some are about to begin the fight. So I'm just, it's so advanced, it's only a matter of time before the body falls apart. So in such a time, a big problem that comes is the gloom and doom in the mind. That actually, the cancer, my life is over now. And especially if the cancer is in advanced stage where there is just no hope for survival. <coughs> then, and if it happens when somebody is young, it just creates so much agony. One is just not able to bear it. I knew one devotee couple in America and uh, Mataji, he's got cancer. They're thinking that, you know, when I see it, when I've got cancer and uh, my husband has to work so much hard to take care of me, they have two kids has to take care of them. They're so thinking, who will take care of them afterwards? She said, just, she's become physically not very injured, but the cancer has made her a mental break. And it's not just she alone, it happens to many, many people. So, now, when I give the example of a cancer, it's like Vritrasur was born with a death sentence. He says, you are born and his father also realized when he chanted the mantra, oh, I chanted the mantra wrong. But the, the child is already born. So right from his birth, it was known that he was going to die. And he's going to die at the hands of Indra. But now, if, some, if we know that, okay, I'm going to die at the hand of Indra, he will stay far away from Indra. Isn't it? But curiously, he goes and attacks Indra. And not only attacks Indra, actually Indra and the Devas are so powerful that seeing their attack, all the soldiers on his side run away. And he's left all alone. But instead of being fearful, instead of himself running away, he goes to the soldiers and says, what kind of cowards are you? Fight here. And they refuse to fight. He fights alone and he fights so forcefully that a devutas panic. And many of the devutas are soldiers and warriors just run away. <coughs> when Indra sees this, 
<coughs> at that time indra attacks him and indra tries various ways to attack him but the battle is just going on and on and finally <coughs> indra has been given a vajra by which he can kill rutra but he uses his own mace so he uses the vajra once and he lops off one arm of indra of rutrasur but as rutrasur is falling rutrasur still keeps marching forwards and still with one hand he is fighting is devouring and then indra uses mace and throws it and like when he throws the mace rutrasur is so sharp that he catches the mace before it hits him and it holds it and turns it around and throws it in there <laughs> and that goes and hits not indra but indra's elephant airavat and airavat just flies into the air <laughs> and airavat falls a huge distance away and indra falls down his crown has fallen down his uh, elephant's teeth are broken you're thinking how do you fight with such a such a person uh, how do you fight with such a person so to give um, more contemporary example suppose there is a champion leg spin bowler and he gets anybody you know just bowls such a googly gets a player out and he bowls a googly and the batsman hits a googly for a sixer what should i do now this is my best weapon so indra is just he feels so ashamed of himself so disheartened just standing there so at that time what does rutra sir do Rutra is telling him, "Come on, fight! So come on, get up and fight!" He says, "Ultimate." At that time, he starts speaking of deep philosophy. He says, "Ultimately, he says we are all servants of the Lord, and therefore we are all meant to do our parts in the service of the Lord. And just do your part. Then the victory or success, failure are never sure. From a winning point, we may lose. From a losing point, we may win." but all that is in our hands is fighting and as a example for that he gives his own example and he says just see pashyamam nirjitam shatru your own enemy nirjitam he says i have practically defeated now vrukna ruddha bhujam rudhe he says <coughs> that my arm as well as the weapon has been cut off and therefore still therefore i should be disheartened but no ghatamanam yatha shakti and still with all my effort tava pran jihirshaya i am trying to de defeat you so normally you know one friend is discouraged we may encourage him, come on you know i am also i am also tired but i am fighting you also fight but if your enemy is discouraged you will be happy you want to encourage your enemy <laughs> come on kill me <laughs> what is this <laughs> so why is vitras are doing like this actually there is a material way of looking at things and there is a spiritual way of looking at things and sometimes the material and spiritual go in parallel and sometimes the material and spiritual go entirely opposite so at the material level what rutrasur is doing is stupid and suicidal if your enemy is discouraged to save your life and come back and attack him again you can save your life now apart from the spiritual level is he spoke in the previous verse says oh my dear lord i just long to be with you he says just as a ajat pakshay mataram khaga stannam yatha vatsatara kshudartha priyam priyaiva vishitam vishinna mano arvinda kshididrukshate tvam so he says that just as a ajat paksha unborn bird see the bird is already born but a bird actually when it gets wings it said to be born at that time so the bird cannot move about fly about right so just that that bird longs for the mother to come back and feed or just as a calf longs for the cow's udder this is a lover longs for her beloved to come back similarly oh dear lord i long to be back with you i long to serve you so he is at the spiritual track what is he seeing he is seeing this body this demoniac body i've got now is the opportunity to end this body and if he keeps fighting if indra keeps fighting he knows that he is going to die because that, that weapon is ordained to kill him but what he sees is through this death i'll be delivered 
So at so at this point, he could look at things in a material way, he could look at things in a spiritual way. And the reaction would be entirely different. At the material way, if he sees, oh, why is such injustice happening to me? All my soldiers have abandoned me, my, my weapon is, my arm is cut off. Such a terrible situation I am in. But in the spiritual way, when he looks, he sees, this is the opportunity for me to get liberated. So for us, when we start practicing bhakti, the bhakti is not a mechanical process. It is a process of conscious, continuous cultivation. The essence of bhakti is conscious, continuous cultivation. What cultivation of what? Cultivation of a spiritual way of looking at things. Cultivation of a spiritual way of doing things. And it is a cultivation means it has to be done consciously and continuously. It's like if we are cultivating a garden, then we have to water the plants of the garden. And if you keep watering the plants, then they will grow. That is continuous cultivation. It's not that one day I water, I put a flood in the garden and seven days I don't look at it. No, continuously it has to be. And also consciously. The consciously means that inside our heart, there are devotional desires, but there are many other desires also. So which desire we are nourishing, we don't know. Sometimes we may be doing service. No, I want to preach about Krishna. And preaching is very good. But if I'm preaching about Krishna, if I'm thinking I want to prove to the world how famous I am, how popular I am, how clever I am, then actually I'm not really nourishing my bhakti I am nourishing my ego. Of course, I am doing service to Krishna, but the purification will be very gradual. So conscious, conscious, continuous cultivation. And this <coughs> choice becomes very apparent for us when we face difficulties. So difficulties means that we had a particular plan to do something and suddenly things go wrong. And quite often, the mind's tendency at that time is to blame Krishna. Or at least to question Krishna. I am doing so much bhakti. Why is Krishna doing this to me? Why is Krishna not doing anything to help me? Maturity is something which is not very easily achieved. We all become physically, we all physically grow up. But to emotionally and spiritually grow up, again requires conscious effort. <laughs> what is the meaning of maturity? Maturity simply means to understand that no one is obliged to fulfill our needs. Maturity means to understand that no one is obliged to fulfill our needs. Let me explain. When the baby is small, the baby just starts crying. And the baby expects that the world should come and feed her or him. And the baby cries and the mother comes running. Mother is not there, some nanny is there, some babysitter is there, some somebody else is there. They take care. So and the baby grows up. All that I have to do is cry and it is the world's responsibility to fulfill my needs. The baby expects, the baby demands. But then, as the baby grows up, he becomes a child, child and youth, and then becomes an adult. Now, adult may also feel hungry, but if the adult starts crying, it's, people may come and feed, people may not come and feed. The adult understands that if I am hungry, it is my need, I have to arrange to fulfill it. I may have to earn a living or I have to go to some friend who can provide me some sub help. I have to go somewhere where I can get my needs fulfilled. So it is not that the need will not be fulfilled. But fulfilling the need is not the world's responsibility. Fulfilling my need is my responsibility. This understanding that no one is obliged to fulfill my needs. This understanding is the defining characteristic of adulthood. 
as long as we think the world is obliged to provide me things to that extent we are still in infancy of childhood infancy of childhood we cry and i want this toy and we don't do anything we just keep crying the mother provides the toy the mother or father provides the toy so many this is a big problem in the western world many kids grow up with what is called the entitlement mentality entitlement mentality means they think i am entitled to get this no you have to provide this to me there's a documentary I, I, one devotee who is into parenting showed me if they are comparing children in <coughs> america and children in africa i said that there is africa in the desert there was this 10 year old girl they were the people are going on a safari hmm? and she also went on the safari the, the, the villagers a group of villagers her family was not there but others were going and she also went with them and the safari was camping at various places and wherever the safari camped everybody started dispersed started uh, started doing various things and this girl herself found some course to do chose okay you now fold this clothes arrange this over there clean this clothes do this do that nobody told her to do it but she found a way to make herself useful on the other hand they showed 10 year old kids in america they were taken to a picnic in a five star hotel or a five star resort and while they were in that five star resort the power, they intentionally arranged for the power to go off and these kids were playing video games they they were beautiful natural setting where this girl was in a desert africa is a desert, very barren country these boys were in a, <coughs> these kids were in a beautiful uh, resort setting greenery all around swimming pool but the moment their video game the power went off and they couldn't play the video game they threw up such a tantrum uh, yelling screaming crying and eventually they started hitting the attendants over there you know, get this get this one of them picked up the video game and just flung it and broke it so now what happened over here the kid is the same age and materially speaking these kids in africa the girl in africa she is having nothing but the difference is of the entitlement mentality entitlement mentality means yeah, i am entitled to this comfort i am entitled for this enjoyment whereas that girl in africa she had grown up in a poor family had no entitlement at all so in life when we work in any relationship with anyone there are two aspects of the relationship there is expectation and there is contribution we expect something from someone and we contribute something to someone Now, if we consider in infancy, there is only expectation and no contribution. <coughs> Expert, I cry, my mother will come and feed me. I demand for this toy, my parents will provide me the toy. But as we grow up, we start understanding that my contribution needs to increase and my expectation <coughs> needs to decrease. In fact, if we we grow adult and our parents grow old. then the parents may not contribute anything but it is for uh, we can't expect much from them rather we have to contribute to them when this understanding so maturity means that we decrease our expectation from others and increase our contribution to others so to the extent we do this to that extent we will stay <coughs> peaceful and purposeful peaceful means our mind if we are expecting too much from others and we don't get it if we are expecting too much from life from the world from god we don't get it we will be frustrated now this this dynamic which i talk about with the parents you know the parents children have expectation from the parents and they demand all of the expectation be fulfilled but as the child grows now there is a finite way in which they recognize that actually my parents are also <coughs> limited beings yeah, i i want this 
a child may say, I want a toy, and the parents may give a toy. But the child grows up into a young man and he says, I want this girl. <laughs> the parents would have the power to provide a girl like that. The child has to, the, the adult has to become mature, responsible, and then they might be provided that. They might be able to get that. So what happens? Because the person because <coughs> the person is um, expecting so much, they get frustrated. But so with, sorry, with, with respect to parents, we understand that our parents are also limited. So I can't expect so much from them. But with respect to Krishna, we start thinking Krishna is unlimited. Krishna is all powerful. So Krishna can do whatever he wants. So then why is Krishna not doing it? So sometimes Krishna's infinitude can make us have infinite expectations from him. So sometimes we start thinking that this world, yes, its world is a place of Dukkha, but I am a devotee, I should not get any Dukkha. It is Dukkha I am, but no, for a devotee there is no, not any Dukkha. Yes, that is true. The devotees are also in this world. What defines a devotee is not that distress does not come at the physical level or the mental level. It is that the devotee transcends the physical and the mental level by absorption in Krishna. So, and if it's cold, it's going to be cold for everyone, whether you are a devotee or non-devotee. If, if it's going to be hot, it's going to be hot for everyone. So, but <coughs> some people. They don't talk anything except about the weather. You know, oh, today the day is so bad. Today it's so hot. Today it's so cold. Okay, it's cold. Move on with life now. What are you going to do about it? So, you know, there are certain things which are just not going to change. They are the nature of the world. But sometimes we expect unrealistically from Krishna that there should not be problems in our life. I was in Canada about a month ago, and there. Uh, there is a devotee who is a psychotherapist and he told me that he had been practicing psychotherapy for many years at an individual counselling level and now he has started a group psychotherapy. So I asked him, you know, who would want to come in a group and tell everyone their problems? He said, no, we have a, vote of, we have a vow of confidentiality that nobody should tell anything in the circle. But he said, the big advantage of having group psychotherapy is that when everybody hears others' problems, they start feeling, my problem is not that bad. <laughs> 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 See, the mind, whenever we get problems, the mind makes us think, hey, no one has problems like you have. You are suffering so much. And that is what makes us very miserable. I just gave a class before this on the mental health problems in today's world. What has happened? Why are mental health problems so much Many in today's world? Many reasons. One reason is that actually mm, many people have a false expectation about the nature of life in this world. Because of technology, because of the media, because of the movies, we think that life is a world, the world is a happy place. That things are going to be wonderful. And then when things don't turn out to be wonderful, we have grown with this entitlement. Life is going to be great. If it doesn't turn out to be great, then the movies still keep showing on, oh, things are wonderful. People outside are still smiling. People are going on with their life. So we start thinking, I alone am suffering. Everybody is happy, I am suffering. Why am I so unfortunate? So this devotee told me that after one very good psychotherapy session, and everybody spoke, spoke their heart. Then he said, I did an exercise. That I asked everyone, if every one of you could take out your problems and put them on the table, hmm? would any of you want, want to exchange anyone's problems? Nobody said, no, my problems are okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, in this world, everybody has problems. And um, as devotees, if we start expecting that devotion will act as an insurance from problems. 
then that is an unrealistic expectation. <coughs> but what we can expect is that even amidst problems, if we take shelter of Krishna, then we can get relief from problems. So I start out, I talked about how there are two tracks of reality. There is a the material reality and there is a the spiritual reality. And even if we are practicing bhakti, there is no guarantee that our thoughts are going on the spiritual track. Our thoughts may still go on the material track. And even when we are doing some service to Krishna, <coughs> we may start thinking, no, I work so hard, but nobody appreciates me. That devotee does such little service and so much praise comes with that. So, there are so many ways in which even in devotee circle, our mind may take us on the material track. <coughs> oh, see, when I speak, so many people listen to me. If I come to a temple, I look not at the deities to go and offer obeisances, I look at how many of my juniors are offering obeisances to me. <laughs> so, I am coming to a spiritual place, but my mind is in material consciousness. I am going in front of the deities and offering obeisances, and my mind is thinking, why didn't this person offer obeisance to me? What has happened? The mind is still in material track. That's why I said bhakti is conscious, continuous cultivation. Our consciousness will go on the material track, get it on the spiritual track. It'll go on the material track, get it on the spiritual track. On the spiritual track means what? That a devotee learns to see life spiritually. Life spiritually means what? When we face problems in life, one response with material consciousness could be material track responses. Now, why is this happening to me? Now, why is Krishna not doing something about it? But on the spiritual track, the response will be see, scripture had told this world is a place of distress. Now I am experiencing distress. Therefore, what Krishna has said in the scripture is true. So the same distress which could have made us resent Krishna can deepen our faith in Krishna. What Krishna has said is true. But that doesn't mean, of course, that oh, this world is dukkhala, so say dukhi. Now, that is not the mood of scripture. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells, Krishna tells Arjuna, this world is dukkhala. At the start of the, Arju, start of the Gita, Arjuna is dukhi. He is crying with tears in his eyes. Tam tatha krupaya avishtam. Ashuru Purna Kulekshanam. Now Krishna doesn't tell Arjuna, Oh, this world is Dukkhala, you are Dukhi, stay Dukhi now. <laughs> no, that is not the point. Krishna gives him the spiritual wisdom by which Arjuna regains his composure. In 18.73 says, Nashto moha smuti labdha tat prasadan maya chuta sito smigata sandeha karishye vachanam tava He says, sito smi, my mind has become calm. I have become composed. So what this means is that Krishna is also providing Arjuna the process by which to become calm even amidst life's storm. Life will give us storms. But if our consciousness is fixed in Krishna, we can experience calm. <coughs> An example to illustrate this, say outside it's very hot and we are feeling tormented by the heat and here there is a room in which there is air conditioning. If we come inside the room, we will experience relief. But if we stay outside the room, the heat will torment <coughs> us. Similarly, you could say outside the room is material consciousness. Inside the room is Krishna consciousness. Whatever be the situation we are in, if we just become conscious of Krishna, then we will feel peaceful. We will feel calm. We will feel some relief. So, whatever be the problem, first let me just chant Hare Krishna. Let me try to hear about Krishna. Let me try to speak about Krishna. Let me try to read about Krishna. Something. Let me pray to Krishna's duties. Become conscious of Krishna then we will get some relief, we will get some calmness. Unfortunately, what we do is that we come to the air-conditioned room and we open the door 
and we demand that the world become air conditioned. What does that mean? That means we have problems and Krishna can give us relief from the problems. We come to Krishna but instead of becoming conscious of Krishna, we remain conscious of our problems even in the presence of Krishna. That means we come to Krishna and we say, when are you going to solve this problem? Yes, problems will come, problems will go. No. I, when I do this workshop for gratitude, I did one in London recently. So, we have some exercises that we do. So, one exercise is, we don't have time for it now, but maybe if you want, you can do it later. Now, look back at the last 15 years of your life, as much as you can remember, and think in every three years ago, what was the biggest problem in your life? Three years ago, maybe you're going to get admission engineering, or just preparing for 12th exam. Three years before that, maybe your favorite toy had broken down. Three years before that, something. Now, just look at our life, or even one year before, and look at what was the biggest problem at that time. And you know, at that time, that problem would have seemed overwhelming. If you're giving your 12th exam, if I don't pass in this, my whole life will crumble apart. Now that problem had... Now if you look back at how worried you were, the problem you were, you know, what is the need to be so worried? So you have survived that problem. When problems come, the mind catastrophizes the problem. Catastrophizes means hey, it's everything is going to fall apart if this problem stays. But things go on. When the mind catastrophizes problems, let the intelligence contextualize the problem. Contextualize means see in context, see in perspective. This world is a place of distress. Problems come, problems go. No need to get so worked up about it. And Krishna will help us to deal with the problem. So, if we can just get our consciousness on the spiritual track, then whatever problems come, we'll be able to deal with them much better. But if our consciousness stays on the material track, then our devotion will start seeming pointless to us. I'm doing so much seva, I'm doing so much chanting. Why is Krishna not helping me? Krishna's help is not just in solving the external problem. Krishna's help is also in changing our internal consciousness. That, that is his primary help. So if we seek that help, Krishna, how can I be conscious of you? Krishna, how can I serve you? I am your servant. Please guide me. How can I serve you? If we have that mood, then Krishna will show us the way. I'll conclude with one point, last point. Prabhupada says in a lecture, how do we know whether we are Krishna conscious? You could define Krishna conscious in many different ways. Always chant Hare Krishna. Think of Krishna's past in Vrindavan. Think of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, whatever. Prabhupada says, when you come to a temple and you look at the deities, and if you feel that Krishna is asking you, what are you doing for me? If you feel Krishna asking you, what are you doing for me? Then you are Krishna conscious. So our defining relationship with Krishna, our eternal identity is an identity of service. If we feel, Krishna, how can I serve you? If that is what will keep us always focused, that will keep us on the spiritual track. Most people come to the temple and ask Krishna, what are you doing for me? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of what am I doing for you? So this is, if we have this mentality of entitlement, now I'm a devotee, now I should not have any problems. If I have too much expectation from Krishna, then even in devotion we'll experience frustration. But if we focus on, devotion means not so much expectation from Krishna, <laughs> but contribution to Krishna. Krishna, how can I serve you in this situation? Just that attitude of service will actually empower us. Because if we want to enjoy in the world, if we want some success in the world, that depends on so many conditions which are not in our control. But if I want to serve, in any situation I can serve. So in that sense, the service attitude is empowering. I got this big problem, but I am a servant of Krishna. As a servant of Krishna, what can I do? I have to chant with Krishna, my mind becomes calm. You know, in this situation, I can take this one step forward. Take one step forward. Take one step forward. 
Sometimes we make a bull plan of our life and suddenly everything seems to be disrupted. So it's like we, the road ahead is lit and suddenly power goes off. So when power goes off, what do you do? Some of us may curse, some of us may rant. But then afterwards we take our phone out, turn on the flashlight. The flashlight does not replace the street light. But the flashlight can show us one step ahead. And when we take that one step, the flashlight shows us again the next step ahead. And again the next step ahead. So similarly, for us, sometimes we may have a plan in our life and life's adversity may just turn off the street lights. So at that time, our service attitude is our flashlight. So Krishna, how can I serve you now? How? One step forward. How can I serve you now? One step forward. How? So if you just keep <laughs> taking one step forward, one step forward, we'll find that we will cover a significant distance and eventually the lights will come back. Eventually, Krishna will reveal his plan for us, which was actually better than our plan for ourselves. So, Vritrasur had that vision to see Krishna's plan, that although he was dying a painful death at the hands of Indra, of Indra, of Indra he was seeing that he's getting liberated from this demoniac body material existence, he's going to Krishna's abode. And that's why he was, he was, come on Indra, kill me. Because he was not on the material track, his consciousness at all. So by hearing pastimes like this, and by trying to ourselves consciously, continuously cultivate bhakti, we can also get our consciousness on the spiritual track. And then we will see Krishna's grace, Krishna's mercy, Krishna's love of flooding our life and guiding us through all the problems of life towards the eternal security of his unending love. I'll summarize. I spoke today about how <clears throat> when life gives us life hurts us, we don't have to let the mind hurt us more. I talked about how Vritrasura is about to die and yet he's killing Indra. Come on, fight. And he gives his own example. Just as I am fighting, you also fight. So I talk about how some devotees get some we get cancer diagnosis, it can be devastating, and especially if it's a terminal cancer. It's totally shattering. At that time, the mental wreckage hurts much more than the physical wreckage. So how do we avoid that? Talk about how this, we have two tracks of consciousness. That the material track and the spiritual track. And the two see differently. And what keeps our consciousness on the material track is the entitlement mentality. I talked about how kids in Africa, even in difficulty in a desert, just think, think of some course to do, contribute. Kids in America, in a retreat, in beautiful greenery, beautiful natural setting, just because one power goes off, the video game stop working, just throw up huge tantrums. So maturity means to understand that no one is obliged to fulfill our needs. Fulfilling our <coughs> needs is our responsibility. A baby cries and demands the world to fulfill its needs. But we, as we grow up, we understand crying is not of use. We have to work to fulfill our needs. So, so just as children expect a lot from parents and contribute very little, but as they grow up, the contribution increases and the expectation decreases. Similar dynamic has to apply to our relationship with Krishna. But because Krishna is infinite, so we have infinite expectations from Krishna. And we think Krishna can solve any problem in a moment. Why is he not doing it? And if we come with this entitlement mentality towards bhakti, then our bhakti will get choked because we will feel Krishna is not doing anything for us. But, so Krishna is doing for us, but what is he doing? He is actually helping us to raise our consciousness above the material level. <coughs> this world is a place of distress for everyone, devotees and non-devotees. The mind increases our misery by making us think that we alone are suffering. But everyone is distressed. I talk about the devotee psychotherapist doing group psychotherapy. So, for us, when problems come, if we think this is a confirmation of what Krishna has taught in scripture, then this world is a place of distress. When problems coming can increase our faith. And then, just as Krishna provided solace to Arjuna by giving him the path to spiritual consciousness, then you can say, just as Krishna helped Arjuna overcome his misery, I can also overcome my misery if I become conscious of him. So, it is our need to get relief from distress. But if we demand Krishna change the nature of the world, it's like we have the entry to the AC room, 
but we demand that the whole world be made easy. So getting our need fulfilled, that I want to be relieved from cold heat, that is not the world's responsibility to become air-conditioned. It is my need, so I have to go to a room which is air-conditioned. Similarly, when the world is giving us problems, it is our responsibility to become conscious of Krishna, and that's how we will become relieved from problems. So the problem may still be there, but at least our mind's reactions will not worsen the problem. When we, when we come to Krishna, better be conscious of Krishna, not conscious of problems. And to do that, we focus in our relationship with Krishna more on contribution rather than expectation. Not demand from Krishna, what are you doing for me? But ask, what can I do for Krishna? So when life becomes dark around us, our service attitude can become a flashlight, which will show us one step ahead, one step ahead, one step ahead. And in that way, even through the darkest of life's problems, we will be able to go through and grow through in our devotion to Krishna. Thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Tai Gaur Premanande.